Have you ever thought about how we called the planet we live on Earth? We called it dirt, basically. Soil. What we stand on. But it got that name because it's descriptive. It is what it is, and it's probably all that humanity could agree on. Clearly, coming up with place names, be it planets, cities, continents, countries, is hard. So we're going to go through how they start, how they change, and their broader relationship with power and migration. And by the end of this, we'll go through a detailed example of the step-by-step -step process to creating fictional place names. And all of this is made possible by today's sponsor, World Anvil. They're a fantastic resource for world builders doing stuff just like this, run by really good people. As always, links down below, do go check them out, they're really great. Also, watch out. I've got a massive announcement coming soon to do with other YouTubers, charity, and mental health. So keep an eye out. Place names tend to have three dimensions that make them meaningful, interesting, and realistic world building. They tell us something about the place, they tell us something about the history, or they tell us something about the people. The first of these is the one that most people tend to figure out. Place names are born when language meets topography. Overwhelmingly, place names refer to natural or man-made landscape features. For a natural example, in the River Avon, Avon means river. So yeah, it, it means river river. Or in the case of man-made landscape features, the word Sister or Shester means castle. Gloucester means the castle of Gloucestershire, a region in the United Kingdom. The moral of the story here is that our ancestors weren't particularly imaginative when it came to place names. But then again, half of America calls all fizzy drinks Coke. So... With this being the basis for most place names, you don't need to create an entire language, but consider creating a lexicon of words in the regional language for those places in your fictional world. Things like forest, river, hill, valley, farm, castle, village, and so on. This gives you a good basis for suffixes or prefixes or base nouns for places in your world. For example, the word Minas means tower in Sindarin in Tolkien's works, which is why it so often appears in compound names throughout Middle-earth. Minas Tirith means Tower of the Guard, and Anumanas means Western Tower. Tolkien drew a lot on that base lexicon of words he created in naming places throughout Middle-earth. The second of these is that a name tells us something about the history. Gregory McNamee wrote about how place names afford a kind of folk history, a snapshot in time that enables us to read in them a record of important events. For example, the name Matanza in the Florida Matanza River means slaughter, taking its name from a massacre of Protestants by the Spanish that happened there, hence why it's in Spanish. For a fictional example, in George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire, the capital city of King's Landing is named for the place that King Aegon landed and built his first fortress. It's a pivotal event in Westerosi history that brought the continent into a new era. It's no wonder that the name stuck. And in terms of naming places after historical events, these events don't necessarily need to be true. We name a lot of places after legendary or mythical events. In Avatar The Last Airbender, the city of Omashu was named for the mythical original earthbenders, Omar and Shu, who supposedly learned earthbending in the region. It doesn't so much matter whether or not they actually existed or they actually learned earthbending there, but it's part of the perceived folk history, the emphasis that the people who live there put on it. But this said, these type of names are typically less common than topographically determined names like Gloucester, so consider limiting it to the really important historical events in the region. The ones that not only the people would think about, but people outside of the area that they would recognise. It's got to be important enough that this becomes the most recognisable or memorable thing about the area. Lastly, the third thing that a name tells us is something about the people. It's a kind of fossil poetry that allows us to reconstruct something of the culture of the names at the time they assigned the names to the places they saw. What I mean here is that the type of geographical feature that they highlight, or the way in which they frame historical events, tells us something about the people who lived there or historically lived there. Boston was originally called Trimount by early European colonists, named for the three large peaks that dominated the area, but Native American tribes called the place Shawmut, meaning a place of water to ferry across. The European name emphasises the land where they were first able to build their new settlement, in spirit of the Puritans finding a new home while the Native American name tells us of the ability to travel across the waters and how important that was for their life in this region. The emphasis on different geographical elements here tells us something about the people, the two different perspectives to see the land from, what they valued, what they worked with or used the land for. There's a gold mine in the Forest of Dean in the UK, but the Welsh used this area for a defensive hill fort. 
hence the name Dean rather than Ha. This is often the case for places named after historical events. Using terms like peace, victory, tragedy, or disaster tell us something about what that event meant for their historical identity, whether something good or bad came of it, and what this place means for them. A great fictional example of this is Tolkien's city of Osgiliath, meaning City of the Stars. It's centered around a great dome that looks up to the sky, an important geographical feature, yes, but it echoes back to how important the stars were in Numenorean culture, that their people and those who settled there came from. However, what place names most commonly tell us about the people is very simply who they are. England is the land of the Angles, Scotland is the land of the Scots, and Russia is the land of the Rus, and there's nothing wrong with that. Auckland and New Zealand? Yeah. Land of the Orcs. On a more local level though, it's often just whoever lived there first. Hildesheim in Germany was named after a major landowner in the area called Hildwin. Don't be afraid to have simple names. Simple names stick. Though I do want to caveat this by saying that the size of the region does matter in what name it ends up with. Generally speaking, the larger the region, the broader the name has to be because it's about what they typically have in common. It's why names are often more specific at a local level, with villages or counties or even regions, because there's fewer people to recognize what they're all about, what the most important thing of this region is. But place names in your fantasy or science fiction world aren't just tree land or big battle or wood elf place. That'd be boring and lame and pretty jarring for the reader. <laughs> no, those three big things, place, people, and history, may be the bedrock on which names are based, but a big part about how they sound is how they change over time. Take our example from before. Gloucester has not stayed the Castle of Gloucestershire since the reign of William the Conqueror. It has evolved to a name distinctly its own. Now, there are a whole host of reasons that names and words change over time, but we're going to focus on the organic processes by which words and names change. The first is language evolution. The dominant language in the region changes. Perhaps the word for lake changes to lark, so people would start calling Lake Michigan, Lark Michigan. Or it may mean that people add modifiers to add clarification when a word becomes unclear in its meaning. This is where you get these wonderful tautological names like River Avon, meaning River River because the angle didn't understand Welsh, but let's be honest, who does understand Welsh? Mount Monganui? Yeah, mountain, big mountain. Moon Moon? Yeah, that's, wait, no, that's, that's a different thing. The second way names change is through simplification. This is one of the more important steps, as it's what removes extra modifying words like of, the, and on, turning Topo Nuiatia into Topo in the North Island. But it also removes or combines syllables that are difficult to pronounce or easily skipped over true for place names or otherwise. For example, Tolkien's old elvish word for dreadful was gear, but this evolved over time to be gear, losing the accent and a number of letters to simplify. Also, I'm using Tolkien as an example because he's really the only one with enough linguistic breadth there. <laughs> the third way is conflation. We discussed before a lexicon of base nouns, prefixes and suffixes for places like farm, castle, river, field, hill, valley, and so on. Where these indicators sound similar, they can bleed into use with one another especially as the original word falls out of use. For example, frith meaning woodland and firth meaning watery inlet in Old English have sometimes been conflated in historical maps as the language changes and these things get conflated. Lastly, elaboration. This is when people add modifiers, but not because the original word has lost its meaning or it becomes unclear, but to distinguish it from a place with a similar or the same name with words like upper and lower or greater and lesser or bigger and smaller. I don't know, is there any example of one place called like bigger thing? I don't even know. Like for example, you may not know, but there is a place within London called the City of London, which is distinctly a different place. People may add additional geographical descriptors if the land itself has changed. Some towns in Spain were named after flowers or trees that no longer grow there. So when designing a place name, base them on one or two of these three foundational categories, place, history, or people but then take them through one or more of these changes, evolution, simplification, conflation, or elaboration. These changes should also reflect the changes in the area topographically, demographically, and linguistically, so that there's a pairing between the history you've created and the names of your world. But here's something that world builders don't often consider when naming places in their world. Power. Names aren't just about the place, history, or people, but who gets to choose the name of a place is about who holds power there. Constantinople was the capital of the Byzantine Empire for nearly a thousand years. 
Its name was taken from the Christian Emperor Constantine, who made it the capital in 330 AD, and it became a centre of power for the West for centuries. However, in 1453, the Ottoman Empire brought the city to its knees, and Mehmed II officially renamed it Istanbul, and it became a centre of power for Islamic culture. The fact that the Arabic name began to be recorded in official maps made by the Ottoman Empire and other Islamic powers at the time, and that the Arabic name is used by Islamic countries today, tell us not only that the Ottomans held power in the area, but who their allies are, and who respects that name. But the interesting thing is that right through to the 1900s, European maps still referred to it as Constantinople. The fact that many Westerners still refer to it by its Western name today isn't just a coincidence. It's a rejection of the power that Turkey is trying to exert, and a repudiation of that ownership of it. And the power struggle over Constantinople's name goes right down to the post offices. They will not deliver mail unless it's labelled to Istanbul. We can see by the maps, by the names that people use, who is in power and what that region means to them, as opposed to anyone else in the area. When it comes to place names, how you design a world map, which name is in usage, who designs it, is about their language and what that place means to them. When you look at a world map, you can see some measure of power structures written into it by the names that are used. Also, just for fun, here's a map of all the places that Alexander the Great named after himself. <laughs> And the most common way that we can see these power dynamics arise is through the use of endonyms and exonyms. Broadly speaking, endonyms are names bestowed on a place by those who live there, while exonyms are names bestowed on a place by those outside of it. Scotland, for example, is an exonym given to the region by the Romans. It is the land of the Scotty. But Scotty was the name the Romans used, while they called themselves something closer to the Gaels. But the fact that the Romans held power in the region, as well as being the ones who kept historical records and detailed maps, meant that over time, it was that name that stuck instead of perhaps the Galand that they may have chosen for themselves. People respected the Roman name, so that was the one that took root. A fictional example of this is in Tolkien's Entwood, a great forest to the south of Middle-earth. Entwood is an exonym used by most humans, because that's where the Ents live. Once again, our imagination proves itself. But the Ents themselves have their own endonyms for the place they live in, meaning Sunrise Forest, because they remember when their forest was the easternmost part of a greater forest, where the sun rises. But this name is never recorded or remembered by anyone else, because the powers of the land, the humans, record it in their own way, and most people refer to it through that exonym. So don't just think about what the name of a place is and what it means to the people who live there. Think about what it means to the people who don't, and which name is going to stick, and why. Now, what you're probably noticing here is the inherent relationship with all of this to colonialism. Indigenous populations will usually have their own exonym for an area. For example, the Māori name for my own post-colonial country is Aotearoa. But colonial powers just did this thing where they tended to ignore indigenous names. We shall name this place. What do you mean name this place? It's called- Do you have a flag? A what? A flag. Well, no, but I mean you can't just rename- No flag, no name. This is New England! Hence, New Zealand. So, post-colonial regions tend to have two names for any given place, an endonym and an exonym. And which is recorded and remembered tells you a lot about where indigenous populations tended to hold more power. For example, in New Zealand, there are a lot more Māori names in the North Island than the South Island, reflective of the fact that 90% of Māori live in the North Island, as opposed to just 10% in the South where European names are a lot more common. And in the context of colonialism, names don't just reflect power, but politics. The name New Zealand was the predominant title for my country right through to the 1990s, but a government initiative to revitalise the Māori language over the last two decades has led to Aotearoa becoming pretty widely used. It's on official documents, maps and classrooms, where it may not have been before. By looking at a map and seeing which language or style of names is used where, you can almost map out where ethno-linguistic groups are, who holds power there, or who has held it historically, especially in important geopolitical sites, and what that means to those given groups in power. Lastly, place names are also about migration. World building isn't just about intense detail, it's about how the different factors of your world work in with one another. And this goes for the same with your place names and your history. See, people groups move about all the time, and they take their language, culture, and ideas with them. And this includes how they name things, which geographical features they would emphasize, their linguistic syntax, and their lexicon. 
Even if after centuries they left the region or are entirely wiped out or are overtaken by a new group, remnants of them being there would remain. And seeing where their linguistic traits linger tells us about the history of the area and the history of that people. A great example of this is the city of York in the United Kingdom. The Danelaw was a region that the Danes controlled in England. Danish words like Hal for village and Thorpe for hamlet blended into the Anglo-Saxon style of names for that region. This is a really cool map that shows you how English and Danish names were blended together and where the Danish held the greatest influence and they lived. And though the Danes were eventually pushed back in certain areas, areas, these linguistic traits remained. The city of York went from Old English that to Old Norse Jorvik to Middle English York, combining elements of both of these languages. Consider mapping out where ethno-linguistic groups have moved in your world historically, and which linguistic traits they would leave behind, which ones that the people who live there would be likely to pick up, even if a new dominant language overtakes afterwards. But let's do it, together, let's put all of this work to the test and create a city name. Step 1. Place, history, or people. The city that we're talking about is going to be built around a waterfall that provides fresh water to the people, but they also believe that their god is made of water, so they call this place the Divine Falls. Step 2. Change. Over time, the word divine evolves into the word divin, and the people simplify the language to remove the, and the words blend together to become divin falls. Step 3. Power. However, soon enough the land is invaded and a new people move into the region. These people have trouble pronouncing their Ds, and they don't realise what Divin Falls originally meant, so they change it to Heaven Falls Palm, which in their language means Heaven Falls Waters, and it's clarifying what it means to them. This name is the one that is recorded on maps and falls into use as their people dominate the region politically and in terms of population. And there we go, it goes from the Divine Falls to Heaven Falls Palm. And that to me sounds pretty natural, it's believable, I can see that happening. What about you though? Because with maps and place names and intense etymology, you've got to get away to record them. And in that spirit, I cannot recommend World Anvil more. See, you get to create wikis and profiles for all parts of your fictional world, and why not add etymology to the list? It's designed for world builders, it's run by amazing people, and I would not recommend it unless I knew how good it was. It's got features perfectly designed for being a game master, a writer, a role player, or a pure world builder, and it's been really cool to hear from those of you who picked up World Anvil since my last sponsor with them. As always, links down below at www.worldanvil.com to check it out, and when you've got a World Anvil page, please do shoot me something on Twitter, I would love to see how you developed your etymology for your place names. So in summary, with all of this together, firstly, Place names most often tell us something about a central geographical feature, but they can also refer to important historical events or the people living there themselves. However, which geographical features, historical events, and the descriptors given also tell us something about what the people value culturally. Consider creating a lexicon of base terms like forest in that regional language. Secondly, place names change across history as the language evolves, speakers simplify the name, segments of the name get conflated with other terms, or people add modifying words to help define the name when it gets confused. Consider how the words in your lexicon may have changed or variants that may have developed. Thirdly, which place names are recorded, survive, and fall into use are also about who is in power and what the city means to them. Endonyms are names given by those who live there, while exonyms are given by outsiders. This is particularly common in colonised regions. Consider mapping out where linguistic groups hold power and using important geopolitical sites to demonstrate this power spread. Fourthly, where the linguistic traits, such as syntax, grammar, words or emphasis on a place, event or people, of a particular ethno group can be found, tell us about which groups live there or did so historically. Consider mapping out where linguistic groups are, have been or have travelled through and use linguistic traits from those group to show this. But that is all from me, come follow me on all my places, thank you so much to my patrons, support my work if you're into it. But until then, stay nerdy, and I'll see you in the future. <laughs>